Welcome to Pomo Arts Virtual Artist Talk with Jillian Haig. I'm Janice Cotter, Gallery Manager. Uh, to start the evening, Pomo Arts would like to thank our Board of Directors and our longtime sponsors, or pardon me, our longtime supporters, the City of Port Moody, the uh, Province of British Columbia for their support through the Community Gaming Program, the Government of Canada for their support through the Canada Summer Jobs Program and Peller Estates. In addition, we'd like to thank our 2021 gallery sponsor, Edgar Developments. This sponsorship was announced a few weeks ago, but such exciting news bears repeating. Totaling $15,000 for the year, the sponsorship with Edgar will allow Pomo Arts to continue to offer free exhibition or free public exhibitions during this difficult pandemic period to grow our digital footprint and to build a foundation upon which Edgar's own Woodland Park public art plan can further enhance and support the arts in Port Moody. We are grateful for Edgar's support and for their dedication to uplifting the arts in our community. I'm pleased to have Peter Edgar of Edgar here to say a few words about this exciting partnership. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, Janice. Uh, very kind words. Um, uh, we're, uh, we're very, very excited to be, uh, uh, to help support Pomo Arts and, uh, uh, and be a part of the arts community in Port Moody. Um, uh, maybe I'll just say a bit about our project. Uh, we have uh, uh, a site, uh, in Seaview, a 24 acre site, the Woodland Park townhome site. And we're proposing a new development there in partnership with BC Housing, uh, where we would uh, we would be building really homes for everybody. Uh, we'd be, we, through BC Housing, we're able to offer uh, affordable rental homes. We're able to offer market rental homes uh, and we're able to offer uh, affordable homes and, and just revitalize that whole area. Um, uh, if, if it's approved by the city, uh, that proposal will also bring uh, approximately $2.8 million uh, into the public, uh, uh, in public art to the site. And um, that, that particular, all that art would be located throughout the site um, at various locations. And we would set up a selection process for each, uh, each component of the public art throughout the site. Um, so, you know, we're really excited to, to to work with the community and put together a selection panel um, to explore ideas and ultimately select art uh, uh, and artists for, for that site um, and to bring the community along in that, uh, in that, that process. Um, uh, as a developer, we always, uh, we find that uh, whether it's a public art contribution or just our own um, elective investment in arts, we just think it's a really important part of community uh, and of uh, uh, and and of development, I think it's important that um, uh, the communities get investment in the art from uh, the people that are, are are building those communities. So, real exciting to be uh, to be able to do that in Port Moody, and um, um, and we've just been really inspired with uh, everything we've learned about Pomo Art. So, again, really excited to to be a part of that this year and to have a an ongoing relationship. Um, you know, we're going to be in this community for many, many, many years uh, as we slowly build out this site, uh, and we'd, uh, we're looking forward to continuing our uh, our commitment to to uh, Port Moody and to uh, and to Palm Arts. Um, if anybody's interested in uh, learning more about the project, we have a website at www.woodlandparkliving.ca. Um, feel free to to check it out. And um, we're going to be going to council for a second reading, we think on the 22nd, and then for a final reading, hopefully near the end of July. And um, we're looking for all the support we can get to try and bring this project ahead. Um, so that's it, Janice, thanks so much for, uh, for letting me speak. Thank you, Peter. It was really nice to have you back again. And um, we will see you again soon. Okay, take care. Thanks.
Now uh, it's time for our artist talk. Uh, Jillian Haig is one of our 2021 Quiam Choi Scholarship recipients. This fund was established in 2007 in memory of Quiam Choi, who was an active member of Port Moody Arts, the Port Moody Arts community and the Korean Artists Society of Canada and a mentor to young emerging artists. The scholarship supports emerging artists by covering the cost of mounting a solo exhibition at Pomo Arts, allowing recipients to further their skills and experiences, to expand their artistic careers, and to enable them to better promote their work. In the months between the Quian Choi Exhibition Scholarship recipients being notified and their exhibition dates, we're in regular contact. It has been such a pleasure to get to know Jillian and to follow her progress as she's developed this body of work for the show, as well as participating in the many behind the scenes aspects of mounting an exhibition. Please meet Jillian Hay, a, Billy, a, a, pardon me, a visual artist based in Vancouver. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Emily Carr University of Art and Design, and her work has been featured in exhibitions across Canada. Uh, grounded in painting, Jillian's practice engages in with a larger framework of queer theory, feminist thought, which pursues the limits of our understanding and perception. Her research concerns the readability of images, materials, and text, particularly the intersection of these semiotic systems. While text has a long relationship describing and demarcating painting and sculpture, particularly in the discourse around conceptual art, Jillian is engaged in how side by side, the descriptive power of materials and language may destabilize or unfurl. Um, Jillian, did you want to turn your camera back on and come in? Um, yeah. So now I'm going to pass things to Jillian so she can tell us about her exhibition, Enough Choice Makes a Steady Midnight. After the artist talk, we'll have, time, we'll have an opportunity to talk to Jillian. So please feel free to post your uh, questions, remarks, or greetings for her in the comments. So now I will pass things to Jillian. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. So before we um, start, uh, I just want to acknowledge that this exhibition is taking place on traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coquitlam, Quequet, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Solo First Nations. Uh, I thank each nation who continue to live on these lands and care for them and the surrounding waters. Uh, I also want to thank Janice and her team at Port Moody Arts. Um, it's been a really wonderful experience doing this exhibition, and I think opportunities for really emerging artists uh, are far and few between and very competitive, and I feel really lucky to have been able to share my work in uh, such an unusual time. So, um, as Janice was was saying in my intro, my research kind of concerns the readability of images, materials, and text. Um, and I'm interested in how these things intersect, how the system of signs and symbols come up to each other. Um, again, uh, text has a relationship of, of around conceptual art that it's usually describing or demarcating painting and sculpture. Um, but I'm more interested in how these systems of language can come up against each other um, in, in interesting ways. So before I get into the work uh, for this exhibition, I kind of wanted to give a background on some of my previous work to give a bit more um, understanding about what I my research is interested in. So this work, uh, it's called One or No One, is really engaging with the idea of the two-faced way paint functions. And that is as an image, but also as a surface and a material. 
You can see that it's images of fauna, but on closer look, it's interrupted by text in the surface of the paint. So surface is really important in my work, uh, and I really pay a lot of attention to brushwork. I'm interested in this tension between the readability of the image and the readability of the text. You can see there's repetition in the brushwork um, and how it builds structure and an image, but the repetition of the language works in opposition. It makes meaning kind of unclear. It reads, one is no one is no one is no one, and it just continues this way. It's about losing this point of reference and this idea of an ambiguous one, you know, that being perhaps the subject, um, the artist, uh, the viewer, but also maybe this numerical sense. And it's kind of interesting how that unravels as the text repeats. So this work, uh, it's titled Loose End, Lose End, has kind of a similar st structure and imagery, but the text differs. Um, you can, again, it it's, reads loose end, lose end, um, but the two words share an E. They merge together in the repetition. Um, and the text itself refers to a loss of continuity and a loosening of the relationship between the sign and signifier. I kind of see repetition functioning like pulling a thread. It's as if each stitch unfurls, it builds into this larger gesture. Um, and the structure unfurls as you continue to pull. So this work, again, is another 2019 work. Um, and I was playing with this idea of a monochrome and a grid. Both are very structured and have a particular historical reference. When we think about a monochrome, we think about flatness, abstraction, a surface that's really devoid of a natural subject. But as you go in, you can see that there's a lot more going on at that first meets eye in the texture of the paint. And the text, again, as you read it, changes from surface to surface. In making these works, I really had a desire to make things that necessarily had to be a painting, that couldn't be an image in any other medium. And my engagement with the material and the history of paint, painting is something that I wanted to be inherent in the work. Text kind of in, complicates and informs this process. Um, in the work, text is a material and, but it also has a physical presence. Um, more recently though, in my work coming up to this show, I've been more interested in the symptomatic and emblematic ways language informs my work. So the work that I created for the show, Enough Choice is a Study in Midnight, really comes in response to this um, book of poetry by Gutrich Stein called Tender Buttons objects, food, room. It was written in 1914, so it was a fairly early modernist text. My interest in experimental writing and research led me to uh, the text and unorthodox poems in Tender Buttons, and I first came across it in a reading probably four years ago uh, called The Glossary of Haunting by Eve Tuck and Siri, who are both Indigenous Canadian scholars and artists. And it became an important reading to me, but I didn't really register this quote that began the reading. Um, and so I filed it away on my computer and I didn't think much of that quote, though I continued to read the reading. Um, and then I came across it again in this text by Michael Greaves. Um, the interesting thing was uh, Gertrude Stein really lived in Paris during this time and was in the social circle circles of a lot of early modernist painters and was a large supporter of them. But she lived in these spaces really largely dominated by men. Uh, and as a early modernist writer, she was an openly queer woman. So she really created a unique perspective on early modernist writing. So the poems in this novel um, describe domestic spaces and objects. They really take something that's very familiar and transform it into something unrecognizable. By bringing words into uncommon unions, uh, the normative way we read them is disrupted. Stein is collapsing the way in which words operate in their singularity. How they combine together in various ways really suggests complex ideas and narratives of the things at hand in relation to other things. 
The descriptions are continuously evolving present, being made and remade e with each reading as because we have no reference um, of meaning to bring them back to that is disrupted, they read different every time. It really brings attention to the fragility between the object and the subject, the things in the world and the way in which we as subjects enact them. Her descriptions really refuse to consistently index meaning. Meaning shimmers and becomes elusive. Instead of building a physical sense of an object, her writing shifts, bends, and unravels. Stein turned language on itself, rejecting prescriptive power engendered in language. She really invites the reader into the utopian project of reconstructing language outside of the structuralist framework. So in Tender Buttons, Stein really is emphasizing the difference between the object and the language, the physicality of a thing and its material presence and the words used to describe it. Uh, it's this idea that description is flawed as words are inherently different than things. The objectness of a thing is irreducible to the framework of that language. In the same way, painting is inherently about the distinction between objects and things, between the words and the objects. Um, there's really al always going to be tension between the painting as an object and its material presence versus painting as a meaning or as an image and allusion to another space. It's really inherent in the discourse around painting, um, as well as how these things are realized by the artist in the medium of paint. Similar to Stein's reader, a viewer of a painting it, when presented with something unusual, generates a plausible association or memory to accommodate the strangeness of this experience. And in that process, the reader draws the unknown into themselves, into their history of experiences in order to legitimate it. In some sense, they really exist nearby what it is that they're viewing. This existence nearby is what I see as so compelling about Stein's painting where an object has not quite become a subject. Rather than trying to dissect complex holes into knowable units, I'm more interested in finding moments that refuse to immediately disclose their meaning or significance. Painting for me is much more of a speculative process. I don't really know in the beginning exactly what will happen or what it will look like in the end. It's a slow process first of researching and gathering materials, then taking extreme care in how I handle them. Um, if you've seen the, the, the show in person, you'll see how flat each canvas is. And it's through very many layers and layers of gesso and mediums to flatten it and make the paint glide across it. Um, then they're often primed with oil. And then even still, a lot of the times there's failed attempts under the final image. It's technically demanding work, and in these works they require the paint to remain wet, so I have to finish them in a single sitting. I can't really paint over them either if I make a mistake or add paint or too much, because I have to wait for it to dry, and since they're oil, that can take weeks. But an important part of my research is really spending time in the studio and experimenting with how I handle these materials, really listening and pushing what they can do. Uh, for example, how much oil or solvent you add can make the paint sticky like tar or the canvas into a mud puddle. This work really is about paring everything down. Um, the color, the flatness of the image, um, the surface, and it allows me to focus really on the material, how the material tells a story how I can manipulate it in very way, various ways and how I can listen and see what forms it can and cannot hold. They really became entrenched or become entrenched in the moment that I make them. They're unique and I often can't repeat the process as can be frustrating when I go from planning and studies to final works. Each painting is a really delicate negotiation between the image the brush, the color, and the tone of the paint. 
And in the process of painting, the conversation between these distinct parts comes together differently every time. The subtlety means each stroke or shift of tone also becomes immediately noticeable and important part of the work. Uh, these delicate moments can kind of be difficult to capture and convey in documentation, uh, particularly in the low quality we're streaming at. So um, if you haven't been to the show, I would encourage you to do so. Um, I also have some better images on my website, uh, which you can check out afterwards. Um, yeah, so my practice really is thinking through the things I encounter by listening and responding to the way materials act and react. Uh, it's really about bringing into play not only our knowledge about material and how to manipulate it, but the intelligence of material, understood as adaptive, self-organizing, and irreducible to other frameworks. It's this idea that material has something to tell us that we cannot get through other means of research. Stein, for me, presented a methodology of abstraction and really informed how I think about my work creating a framework for how I make things and kind of helped me understand what centers my work. But it also sent me on a huge research project of looking at other queer, indigenous and feminist scholars have looked at Stein's work uh, from anything looking at the disc or the dialogue in her writing to looking at her poems. There's a vast array of writing and literature that's really opened my eyes to a lot of interesting scholars. And I think what interests me a lot about her work, and I think many others, is those moments where we lose our linguistic mooring, the illusion of stability, and we lose our clarity, the firmness of symbolic language that allows us mastery that we are required to have in order to perform and exist in worlds embedded in colonization and patriarchal structures. In the last year, particularly, I've really had a desire to think about the world around me and my place within it. Making these works is really a meditative process that leaves me time to process these things, to listen and, and really, really listen to the materials, but also to the people around me and the things I read and the things I see. Um, and try to learn without taking, respecting the uniqueness of other experiences that there's always going to be a limit of my knowledge and the work tries to acknowledge or work to try to acknowledge and expand these limitations. I return again to the first time I came across Stein's reading in the writing of indigenous scholars and are reminded that these complex ways of knowing which straddle binaries and embrace complexity have been around far longer than early modernism. While I don't think my work necessarily scratches the surface of these complex questions and ideas, the paintings are remnants of my thinking through them. And I thought I would kind of finish just going back to that first quote or the first time that I saw Stein's work. And I remember being interested in this quote, but not really understanding it. And I think after many months of going through this process of research, I have a different meaning, and each time I read it, it continues to evolve. Um, it's act so there is no use in a center. A wide action is not a width. A preparation is given to the ones preparing. They do not eat who mention silver and sweet. There was an occupation, a whole center and a border making hanging way of dressing. This which is, this which is not why there is a voice is the remains of an offering. There was no rental. Thank you. Hi, Jillian. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, really, Jillian's paintings need to be seen in person to uh, get a full perspective on the depth of them. Um, the gallery is open for in-person visitors daily, and you can check our website, pomoarts.ca, for the hours um, and our COVID safety plan. At this point, um, I would like to invite uh, my uh, new gallery assistant, Kat Waddell, to join us. And Kat's prepared some wonderful questions um, 
for Jillian. Kat is an artist as well. And so I'd like uh, her to maybe uh, ask you the questions, Jillian. She's just going to turn her camera on. Ah, here she comes. Okay, and she's got her sound on. And so I'm going to let you ask the Jillian or ask Jillian the questions. Thanks so much, Jillian. That was an amazing artist talk. I really enjoyed um, listening to everything about your creative process uh, and actually even answered some of the questions that I had uh, prepared for you here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was very thorough. It was very engaging. I loved it. Um, Considering the visuals in your work and how they blur between the recognizable and the unrecognizable, can you tell us more about your creative process in terms of what objects and textures you're drawn to as subject matter? And what is it about these objects that piqued your curiosity? Yeah, I get this question quite a bit, actually. Um, and it's funny because when I first set out to respond to Stein's work in some way, I really was at this point of not really knowing what I wanted to make and being unsure about what I wanted to respond to. I knew that I was interested in this work and I wanted to respond to it in some way. And so I really took the way that Stein had structured her um, book and thought about it in terms of my own way of working and, and that's she drew uh, or on these domestic things around her. So I chose the subject of textiles. So I looked at very various garments, anything from like a 16th century petticoat to the latest Vogue and found these like very intimate moments and kind of zoomed in on them and then distorted them and then you know, there were various layers of uh, digital distortion and then distortion of me, like through the painting process as well. So they kind of became these very different things where you wouldn't really recognize them from the normal thing. But I was just interested in, um, I think fabric has an, is an interesting subject because it has form and it mimics, I think that's the other thing, like it's very organic and it mimics a lot of things in nature. Um, and it kind of makes me think about just like the way the world works and, and different forces and anyways has the, all these other little bits and pieces which I think kind of speaks to how Stein's work is it, it pulls into all these different weird others other spaces. Amazing. And, um, oh, sorry, oh. I'm just going to ask one question. Well, mm -hmm. and then you can ask one. Okay. Cat. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, I didn't tell you that. Um, actually, I wanted to go back to um, the preparation of the body of, the, of work. You uh, were creating it for this exhibition. And I wondered, is this the beginning? Is it complete? Or will you continue to add to it? I think it's just changed the way I've started working. Uh, so I think I'll continue maybe like exploring that way of working, but I don't know if I'll continue to explore things in relation to Stein's work. I think also just my research then has like kind of pushed me to other things and, and she sort of centered things for me and helped me had some sort of lens to focus through. Uh, but I definitely want to continue making work and I'm not necessarily like just focused on this one structure. But yeah, I have, I have lots of new things kind of on the go, lots of experimentation. I'm sort of at this stage of research in the studio where I'm trying to figure out what's next. Um, I'm not sure if it's just me, but it sounded like your volume went down. Did you notice that, Kat? Uh, a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak a bit louder. Yeah, no, it just, it, yeah, it's still down a bit. That's unusual. Okay, Kat, I'm going to let you go. I know you still have a few questions that you have prepared. Honestly, Jillian's just answering them as I, <laughs> as I go along, which is amazing. It's like you're right in my head, um, which means we're on the same wavelength here. Uh, but considering um, Stein's writing, um, I have a couple of questions. One, I was wondering if you have a selection of um, your absolute favorites from her poetry uh, that you didn't discuss in the talk. And considering um, Stein's influence and guidance um, in your practice, I was wondering if you could speak about 
Stein's guidance for your personal expression of gender, sexuality, and identity expressed in your work? And would you consider the paintings in your work or other ones maybe that you've created to be uh, an extension of yourself or perhaps an, an abstracted self-portrait? Yeah, uh, I guess that's a really good question. I think like all the things that we make in some ways are self-portrait because it's our, I mean, to a certain extent, if you create something sort of with the, uh, outside of something else, like I don't really, like when I was making them, I didn't really know how to make them or have seen anything like them. And so I guess maybe they're a self-portrait in that way. And also just because there are this, all these references that I'm kind of interested in. Um, the Stein poetry, yes, I definitely have some favorites. I actually now really want to read a lot of her other work. Um, uh, also, I don't, or all of the titles of the, the paintings are quotes from her. So yeah, there's like, you know, enough choice from A Steady Midnight is, makes A Steady Midnight is a, is a quote from her. Um, they do not eat, who mentioned Silver and Sweet. That was in the last, um, poem I read and also a title no use in a center is also a title um but yeah there's many many quotes each time I read it something else sticks out to me so it really depends on the day <laughs> um but I definitely do have some favorites um and then yeah I guess I think the way that Stein expresses herself is interesting for me because it's not really apparent that it's a feminist text immediately uh, as is a lot of her other works. I mean, it is in some sense because it's it's centered in her identity and also um, the time that it was. It's unusual for women to be writing about such things. Um, but also it's just very open and I think that's why there's so much critical writing about it in so many different fields is because it can interest people in a lot of ways because it's just really about destabilization and that's sort of the thing that interests me and I guess this past year I've definitely been thinking a lot more about that um yeah I've been long interested in like queer and um feminist things but uh yeah I feel like it's helped me express that a bit more in my work and sort of center it in in who I am Kat, you're muted. I am muted. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Um, my last question I had for you, you touched on a little bit uh, with Janice. I was wondering about um, your creative process and what you may be working on next in the studio. And you're saying that it's sort of this unknown space right now in terms of the direction that it's taking. Yeah, I'm just doing more experiments. Uh, it's it's hard to describe. It's like everyone always asks me what I paint, and I'm like, uh, here's a picture. Like, I just can't explain this. It's abstract. It's figurative. It's a thing. Um, similarly, the next thing is it's abstract. It's figure figurative. It's a thing. Um, if if you follow me along on Instagram, if people are interested, you can kind of see I try to post things. I haven't posted anything really recently because things I'm working on right now are not quite at the point where they're working, but something is happening. It's going to be interesting. Hopefully, we'll see. I, I did actually recently, I have to, um, I'm, some of the works, I just made a, the, the work in the a lot of the works in the show also because the space is kind of small are really kind of studies. I'd prefer them at a larger scale, but some of them they're nice in a smaller scale. Um, so one or two of those I painted larger. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. that is exciting. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to let everyone know as well that um, if you wanted to learn more about Jillian's practice and everything, or if you want to connect with her on Instagram, you can find all that information in the artist directory profile page that is linked in the comments. Yes, and we'll actually um, post a link to her uh, gallery, uh, digital gallery as well in the comments so that you can scroll through it. If you're not able to be here in person, you'll be able to scroll through her digital gallery and have a look at the artwork in the exhibition. Um, I actually have uh, something I wanted to touch on. 
Um, when we were going through the lead up to the exhibition, Jillian, um, we met a couple of times for video um, updates so that we could post them on social media and tell people what you were working on in preparation for the exhibition. And uh, one of the things that you had been experimenting with didn't work out, but we had um, put information about it out there that it would be included. And I just wanted you to maybe talk about what happened with the sculpture uh, portion of the exhibition and uh, tell people why it wasn't included. Yeah, I guess, so I was making sugar text pieces. Um, yeah, I first made one for uh, uh, works on paper sale at Trap Projects. Um, and it was like very last minute. I don't actually, everyone always asks me why I started doing this. I, I can't actually remember, but it was a sort of this domestic object and thinking about making text out of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, there was, first it was like having these text pieces. I don't necessarily know if the text was like necessary to have in this work, but um, yeah, I started trying to make sugar slabs that I was going to paint on and stuff, but um, Unfortunately, it's a very fragile process and my studio has a lot of mice, so it's not the best to do in your studio and my partner probably doesn't appreciate having sugar everywhere because it gets everywhere. Um, but yeah, uh, it might be a thing I return to in a while. We will see. Um, but it just kind of, with also the, the space, it's small, it, you know, there was maybe thoughts of having stuff in between the window, but in the end, I think it's better just to be minimal and not have too many things going on. So. Uh, my thought was just because we had addressed it during your last video update that um, people may have wondered what happened. And so I thought it was best to come from the artist and how that evolved, because it is an opportunity for experimentation during the um, exhibition prep. Yeah, I'd love to do more experimentation, but I have a small studio and stuff in oil paint is not a good mix. <laughs> no. um, the, another uh, question I had is you, before the artist talk started, we were talking and you were mentioning the work you're doing with other artists. And um, it sounded like you may be planning to travel soon if travel is allowed. Was I misinterpreting that? No? Okay. I, I, it sounded like you were work, uh, going to be traveling on one of the projects you're working with another artist on. I'm working on a project, but it's, uh, I don't have to go anywhere for it. Oh, okay, okay. That's what I get for, I'm setting up and listening to what's going on in the background and not hearing it accurately, so. Yeah. No, I've been really lucky. I worked for some fantastic artists who have really mentored me since graduating. It's been, yeah, really centering and wonderful, uh, particularly Elizabeth McIntosh and Ian Wallace, uh, both been really mentors for me, as well as all the artists in their studio. Um, yeah, I feel really lucky to have worked with some fantastic people who have been really generous in sharing their knowledge. So, yeah. Kat, did you have any other uh, questions for Jillian? I did, I had one more question, and it actually goes well with bringing up the the experiment that didn't make it into the show. So I was wondering about um, what are things that you've learned through the creation of the works in the show, be it about the materiality of the subject matter or um, its relationship with oil painting in particular, or even uh, your creative process. Yeah, I mean, I think like conceptually, it sort of centered me a lot more. Um, in terms of creative process, it's very different than the other works I was making before um, in terms of surface, but I've come to know that surface is very important to me. Um, and because of that, there is a lot of very complicated, minute things about how paint acts um, for example, how much oil is in the black paint. It depends on the brand. It depends on a lot of different things. So yeah, it's kind of this chemistry experiment of oil droppers and um, solvent and 
trying to mix everything and experimenting, it it kind of turns out and just figuring out how it works in the moment. Um, yeah, I feel like each painting is is a learning experience. Uh, so it's hard to really say one thing in particular, but it's definitely changed my process, I would say. And it's kind of helped me also develop more of an understanding why I'm interested in certain things and how to center that into kind of a more holistic practice. Okay, I'm just looking here. Um, Beth Gallup commented that she appreciates the question, Kat, that drew out the fabric link. And Elizabeth Haig says, hi, Jillian. Um, and, oh, that's it for comments right now. But uh, sometimes they show up after as well. Jillian, did you have anything else you wanted to say about um, the experience or the exhibition or uh, yeah. the work that you'll be continuing with? I'm, yeah, I, I again, I'm really appreciated the experience. It's been difficult. Like I think there, the idea of an emerging artist is really shifting. Now faculty mem members at Emily Carr are now emerging artists. And so if you're recently graduated in an undergraduate program, it's really difficult to find opportunities because it's competitive out there and uh, there's a lot of really great artists. So yeah, I'm really appreciated to be able to share my work and uh, it's a really meaningful opportunity. I hope that, um, you know, sponsors like Peter are able to see that value of really investing in young artists because in 10, 15 years, they're going to be really contributing to the, the vibrancy of our communities and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle and those early step ups really help keep you motivated and propelled. Um, yeah, and I, I'm continuing to make work and I'm really excited for the, the next, my next projects and hopefully I'll, I'll see everybody soon. Well, I hope um, you will continue to keep us in the loop of what you're doing, where you're exhibiting. Um, I do try to uh, follow artists that have exhibited here and if possible, attend exhibitions and keep track of them. It's always nice to, to uh, see the progression of artists through the years. So I uh, appreciate um, you being here this evening and um, preparing the artist talk for us. And uh, it is, uh, the show will run until uh, June 20th, I almost said July 20th. <laughs> uh, it will run until June 20th. So there's still another um, 10 days to come and see Jillian's work, as well as our other Quiam Choi exhibition reci uh, scholarship recipient, Nicole Ponzart, whose artist talk was last week. Um, so I hope that uh, some of you will make that trip out to Pomo Arts to have a look. Um, the Quiam Choi Exhibition Scholarship will be open for applications again at the end of August. So if that's something that interests you, you can check out information on that on our website. Um, thank you very much for coming to watch Jillian's Artist Talk and we will see you the next time. Jillian, did you want to say goodbye? Thanks everybody for coming. Um, yeah, thanks for the support and we'll see you guys soon. Oh, thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>